Okay, so next up is, uh, we're going a little afield. Uh, we're going to the world of, of uh, which happens to be the state tree of Pennsylvania, uh, hemlock. And we looked at this, as, as time is going on, uh, we're increasingly seeing um, the interdependency that, that our program has with other uh, studies that are being done of uh, the forests. Uh, the forests are under siege. I mean, if you just think about this, the species that are getting hammered, uh, everything, su su sudden oak disease, butternut. Um, gosh, I had sp uh, spotted lanternflies in my maple, attacking my maples. And it wasn't that long ago I said to someone, well, at least we have our maples. <laughs> And uh, now they're under siege. Um, ash certainly, uh, and and the and one of the most impressive trees out, out in the wilderness, in the wilds, uh, being hemlock. So uh, today we're gonna we're gonna be hearing from uh, Robert Jetton. Robert grew up in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and um, took an instant af uh, affection to forest and trees, and. Uh, he happened to live in an area that was one of the fastest growing places in the United States. And he also saw what happens when uh, growth kind of collides with uh, sustainable forests. Uh, that must have had quite a um, uh, impression on him because he pursued a degree in biology, uh, then a doctor, a master's in forestry, and he has a doctorate in forest entomology. Uh, today, he's really combined these disciplines and he's a forest conservation biologist uh, at uh, North Carolina State University. His focus is on forest health, conservation biology, forest genetics, and silviculture, all things that are near and dear to our hearts. So welcome, Robert, and I'll let you uh, take command here. All right. Um, thank you, Jim. Everyone can hear me, see my screen OK, my slides. Yes? That's great. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, well, uh, thanks everyone uh, for being here today. Thank you uh, for the Im invitation to come and share with you um, another story, um, as Jim said, of a sort of forest health crisis that we're dealing with um, in the Appalachian Mountains of the eastern United States. And that's the issue of um, really what we talk more about eastern hemlock, but also Carolina hemlock, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, and the threat posed um, by this invasive insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so as Jim said, I do this in my role on the faculty in the Department of Forestry at North Carolina State University, um, where I am housed with a program of CAMCOR. You can see our logo down here on the bottom left. CAMCOR is an international tree breeding and conservation organization. We're primarily commercial in our focus. So we work with um, primarily in the Southern Hemisphere with people growing pines and eucalyptus for uh, fiber and solid wood production. Um, I joined CAMCOR about 15 years ago to develop uh, a U.S. conservation focused portion of our program um, and the hemlock work we do with hemlock is the foundation of that. And of course, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today is work I do in collaboration with a number of colleagues with the U.S. Forest Service, primarily based um, out of Asheville. So my uh, kind of give you an idea of where we're headed today. Um, so just some brief introductory topics, uh, you know, just remind everyone, you know, with, with this group being the Pennsylvania, New Jersey uh, Chestnut Foundation chapter, I, I think you all are very familiar with hemlocks already, but uh, we'll cover a little bit about the hemlocks and the hemlock woolly adelgid, and then kind of go through, you know, where, do, where are we overall um, in, our efforts to develop management strategies for this situation. Um, um, you know, and maybe there's some things in what I present that could be a benefit um, to Chestnut program moving forward, but for certain, there is a lot that we have to learn from you um, in the work that being done in Chestnut breeding and restoration that we need to be looking at applying uh, to the hemlock issue as well. So uh, just to get started here, uh, as, a as a little review, what are we talking about with hemlocks? Uh, we're talking about trees in the genus Suga, right? So Suga canadensis, um, eastern hemlock, uh, members of the pine family, pretty slow growing trees, 
Um, they're extremely shade tolerant. In fact, they're probably the most shade tolerant conifer um, in the Appalachian forests. Um, but they're not obligate to shade. They're actually adapted to grow extremely well, and they do grow very well in open canopy and open sunlight conditions. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little later on. Um, they're extremely long lived. You know, some of the oldest specimens in the 800 to 1,000 year old range. Unfortunately, we, particularly in the Southern Appalachians, most of those specimens we've lost at this point. Um, and there are 10, it's a relatively small tree genus, right? There's only 10 uh, species known worldwide and their distribution is restricted to three primary regions. Um, it's reflected here on this map. It's sort of the center of diversity is in Asia, Eastern Asia. So China, uh, India, a little bit into Nepal, um, Japan and some islands around. So six species there, including this insular population, Suga ulongensis. This is was new to science uh, just a few years ago. Um, uh, so, you know, I was giving this talk back in 2016, I would have said nine species, but now we, we have a 10th species that's been described. Um, of course, and then we have four species in North America, uh, two species out west, mountain hemlock and western hemlock. Um, and then our two species in the east, which we are most concerned with when it comes to hemlock woolly adelgid, the eastern hemlock and the Carolina hemlock. Now, something interesting to uh, talk about uh, with these two hemlock species, um, even though they're sympatric in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, Carolina hemlock is actually from a genetic standpoint, a phylogenetic standpoint, most closely related to the Asian species um, and not very closely related to Eastern hemlock at all. And in fact, Eastern hemlock really is its own group uh, within the genus Suga. Um, is not really uh, directly related to any of the other species. Just a little bit of interesting evolutionary history there. And of course, we are most uh, interested in these two species, Eastern Hemlock, the large geographic range um, in Eastern North America that extends up into Southern Canada in the Maritimes of Canada. So shown here in the light green. And then Carolina Hemlock shown in the darker green. Um, just a, a relatively small number of isolated populations, uh, primarily um, in the state of North Carolina. Um, although, you know, you have some populations up here in Virginia, um, it goes over the border into Tennessee and a little bit down into South Carolina. So my home state, so I grew up right in this area of South Carolina. And I have a hard time showing this map without stating that Carolina hemlock is not actually called Carolina hemlock because... It primarily occurs in North Carolina. It's called that because it was first described on Table Rock Mountain, South Carolina, which is very near uh, by where I grew up. So I always like to, I always like to mention that. So um, hemlocks were a species I experienced a lot growing up, uh, which as Jim said, um, which is really where a lot of my interest uh, comes in. In fact, we had native uh, hemlocks in our yard um, in Greenville, South Carolina, as I grew up, so. So those are the species that we're most concerned with. They're sympatric generally, but they actually occur in very different ecosystems. Eastern hemlock, uh, particularly where it dominates in the Southern Appalachians is a much more of a riparian species. Um, so uh, growing along streams and it'll, it'll grow up um, into the uplands above these streams as well. Um, so obviously has a huge ecological influence um, on on, on these types of ecosystems and particularly for organisms in the stream. As you move to the north and definitely into the upper Midwest, uh, hemlock tends to occupy sort of sites that are more seasonally swampy, uh, but they're not in the areas that would be seasonally wet. Um, so in this picture here from Wisconsin, this low lying area during certain times of the year will be very inundated, but the hemlocks you can see are sort of uphill a little bit from that. Um, so they're gonna be a, a, a little bit drier, drier land. Uh, Carolina hemlock, um, where it occurs, it's primarily occurs at higher elevations on these really uh, rocky outcroppings with high degrees of exposure uh, to the sunlight um, and the elements like that. Um, and so very marginal sites. Actually, it's a pretty tough tree species. Um, these are pretty rocky, very nutrient poor, poor soils where it tends to uh, not really dominate, but where it, it occurs. It definitely doesn't come to dominate stands uh, like an Eastern hemlock does. But Carolina hemlock is also a wonderful uh, species to work with just from the standpoint of beautiful sites we get to go to, um, uh, to, to work with the species. 
This is the Table Rock population I mentioned earlier in South Carolina, um, where the species was first described, uh, where we've done some work. Um, this overlooks a reservoir, uh, the Table Rock Reservoir, which is the main supply of drinking water for the town where I grew up, right? So very, very beautiful ecosystems to go and work. Why do we care about hemlock? You know, from a really a timber standpoint, it's never been overly important. Um, it's definitely opportunistically harvested and it does have uh, wood that can be utilized for construction. Um, it's from a fiber and pulp production standpoint. Um, it actually pulps very nicely. Um, so pulp mills will take it uh, when they when they can get it. But it's so slow growing. It's not really a, a species that can be well managed for from a commercial standpoint. Probably commercially, it was most uh, valued for its bark, um, for tannins, uh, for leather tanning. Um, but more recently, its main economic importance has been from the ornamental industry. Um, so uh, a lot of different ornamental cultivars for hemlock out there. People love having hemlocks uh, planted in their yards. Um, and this was a huge industry, particularly where I am in North Carolina, an industry that's pretty much died out. Uh, uh, although there's some hope that uh, it can be com begin coming back. We'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, but yeah, a lot of nursery growers, particularly in the South, have gotten out of the hemlock business um, until we can get a better handle on some of the issues. And of course, some economic value that's a little bit hard to, to hang a price tag on, um, particularly if you've been to any state parks or national forests um, in the South and gone to campgrounds or picnic areas. They're almost always near a stream. Um, so that all means that that overstory canopy is going to be um, a hemlock, a hemlock forest. Um, and that's got a lot of value from the shade um, those trees produce, uh, making the sites much cooler, much more pleasant places to go camping, particularly in the summer. But of course, as we're losing these trees, um, this is becoming quite a hazard um, as well uh, for these campgrounds. Um, Probably hemlock's biggest value is in its ecological importance. We already talked about its predominance, particularly in the Southern Appalachians for uh, being along stream margins. Um, this has a lot to do influence on the chemistry and temperatures of these streams. Uh, so make them ideal for things like native brook trout um, and other uh, aquatic invertebrates. And as we lose hemlocks, stream temperatures and chemistry are changing, which is gonna have negative effects on those organisms. Um, other wildlife as well. Um, obviously, up in your neck of the woods, uh, hemlock is in any other so sort of evergreen is an important source of winter browse for deer, um, but also for neotropical migrating birds. Um, there are certain species that are obligates uh, to the hemlock ecosystem. Those are the areas they prefer to roost and nest um, during their annual migrations. Um, and so any, any loss of hemlock could have uh, serious ecological implications there as well. So what is the issue? Why are we losing our hemlocks? And it's because of this uh, pest here, the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, adelgi sugi is the scientific name. Um, you've probably uh, seen this in Pennsylvania or New Jersey if you've uh, taken a close look at a, at a hemlock. Um, you see these little white woolly tufts at the, on the underside of the branch at the base of the needles. And these, each one of these is an individual female hemlock woolly adelgid. And if you tease that wool apart, it's sort of a waxy coating that's there to protect the eggs and the female, uh, keep them moist and keep them from drying out. If you tease that apart, you'll find the female insect in a, a large clutch of eggs. And that individual female will produce somewhere around 300 eggs in her lifetime. So very high reproductive capacity. When you think of 300 eggs in this one ova sac and the number of a little woolly sacks uh, that can be on an individual branch. So uh, they can reproduce in very high numbers and they do it all as females only. It's all asexual parthenogenic uh, reproduction. There are uh, no males um, that are part of the reproductive strategy of this insect in the Eastern United States, right? Um, and really at this point, hemlock woolly adelgid is a worldwide herbivore of hemlock trees. Um, of course, it is native insect in Asia. Uh, when it first arrived in uh, the eastern United States, it was known to occur also in the Pacific Northwest on the western and mountain hemlocks. At the time, it was assumed that the insect was exotic in this ecosystem, these ecosystems as well, but 
uh, molecular work has since shown us that it's actually native uh, to the western to Western North America as well. Um, and it's an exotic invasive insect um, here in Eastern North America. It really, uh, the working uh, theory here is that there's some combination of natural enemies, so pre predatory insects that feed on the adelgid, and innate co-evolved host resistance um, in these species um, that protect these trees from the, the adelgid. So uh, similar to uh, blight resistance in Chinese chestnut, uh, we assume uh, species like Tsuga chinensis, um, has some very highly developed, highly evolved defenses against this insect that could be very useful as we think of a restoration strategy for Eastern and Carolina and uh, So what's the current situation as far as uh, where hemlock woolly adelgid is um, in Eastern North America? Uh, it was first detected on ornamental hemlocks in 1951 on uh, in Richmond, Virginia, and these were on Asian species that had been imported for ornamental purposes. So not surprising that that's the route by which it was introduced. Um, and for about 20 years or so, it kind of slowly spread in ornamental settings um, out here, sort of in the more Piedmont regions of Virginia. But it was really in the mid 1980s when it hit the Blue Ridge Mountains um, and it really got to the native large distributions of Eastern hemlock that it really started moving very rapidly to the north and to the south and pushing west. Um, so these dark uh, reddish brown counties are all counties that have confirmed um, infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid um, on hemlocks. And you can see it has jumped over here to the southern tip of Nova Scotia as well, and is actually expanding and killing trees very rapidly um, up in this area just over the last uh, couple of years. So. Um, although it, it does seem to be, it's stalled out and its movement into northern New England uh, really hasn't changed much over the last, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, there does seem to be some hope that extreme cold winter temperatures are going to help prevent the adelgid from pushing all the way um, into southern Canada. The insect is very sensitive to extreme cold temperatures, but seems to have no uh, issues with extreme heat of the south in the summer. Um, do, doing just well establishing itself um, in the south. So kind of what is it doing as it feeds um, on the insect? It's a, a hemipteran type pest, so that means it has a piercing sucking mouth part like a straw that it sticks into uh, the plant tissues. And it's really going after stored res nutrient reserves within the tree. And it, 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 it pulls all those out of the tree uh, for feeding. Um, and this really starts this kind of slow progressive death of a hemlock tree um, where you have a nice healthy looking hemlock, the adelgid infestation begins to grow. Um, and as that adelgid infestation grows and more nutrients are being pulled out of the tree, you start to see the tree turn a little bit chlorotic. Um, the health of that tree begins to decline. Um, and when that happens, um, that actually causes the adelgid infestation to start declining. They, they're very sensitive to the health and the quality of their host. So as they actually reduce the quality of that host, that causes their populations to decline. Um, and as their populations decline, the tree health will begin to improve again. Um, and so that's good for the tree, but then the adelgid responds very quickly to that and its infestations will begin to grow again. And so what you have is this slow, steady decline, which I like to call the hemlock death spiral. Um, the trees kind of bounce back and forth between looking healthy, looking unhealthy, um, as the adelgid continues to feed on it. Um, and you get a lot of uh, uh, related um, things going on here. No new growth production, uh, no vegetative or reproductive bud production. And the, eventually when the trees get to a severe state, but they start to defoliate, they start to drop their needles. Um, and if the tree has experienced any sort of predisposing stress, like a severe drought, this death spiral happens very quickly. It can happen in as quickly as four years. But we have a lot of examples, particularly in the Southern Appalachians where our mortality levels for hemlock have been extremely high. We have a lot of trees out there that are still holding on. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this might be. Um, but we have also for the last, oh, I don't know, uh, five, six years, we've had a lot of rainfall in the south. Um, and so the trees are not nearly under the kind of water stress 
they were when the adulgin first appeared. So we've got a lot of environmental interactions going on here. Um, so trees will hang on for, for qu quite a while uh, with an adelgid infestation, which is an important window of opportunity um, for conserving them and, say, and retaining them in the forest. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. You know, you start out with kind of a nice green, healthy looking hemlock. Um, it'll begin to turn very chlorotic and eventually you get to this stage, which we call the gray ghost. Once a tree looks like this, it's not coming back. Um, it's dead. This is the Linville Gorge area um, along the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina, uh, which is seeing very extensive levels of both Eastern and Carolina hemlock mortality at this point. Um, here's another picture. So we see, you know, if you try, drive anywhere from Virginia south through the Southern Appalachian Mountains, you're going to see areas like this where hemlock was a dominant species. Um, and at this point, uh, the adelgid has uh, completely wiped them out, particularly if they were older growth hemlock. Um, the old growth trees, unfortunately, uh, seem to be uh, the first to go, and they tended to go very rapidly. So it's been a very um, severe issue for us, particularly in the South. So what are we doing to try to slow down uh, the adelgid and, and, and to try to conserve hemlocks? And there's a lot of different angles uh, being uh, looked at. And I'm going to walk through each of these, uh, briefly talk about chemical and biological control, which honestly is probably where most of the emphasis has been placed at this point. I'll talk about adelgid resistance breeding. Um, again, I, this is an area where there's been not a lot of development, but where I think there is a lot for us to learn from the American Chestnut Program and what we should be thinking about doing with hemlock. Um, and then I'm going to talk about more extensively about my own work in gene conservation and silvicultural restoration of the species. So first, let's talk a little bit about chemical control. Most of our efforts in chemical control rely on the systemic neonicotinoid insecticides. These are highly effective at protecting trees. Uh, you're probably familiar with these. Imidacloprid is probably the most widely used one. Um, Dinotifuran is a related uh, species. Um, Dinotifuran is useful because it causes rapid knockdown of the adelgid, but it has a shorter uh, uh, shorter period of time, it will remain effective in the tree just one or two years, whereas the imidacloprid is more slow to uptake in the tree, uh, but it gives a long lasting, this says five, this is actually a little out of date, we say five plus years, we're actually seeing protection of individual trees for seven or more years at this point. A number of different ways um, these can be applied uh, to protect a hemlock um, through soil drenches or in soil injections. Or, direction, or injection directly into the stem of the tree. Um, or these little things here, these are really cool technology, Cortec tablets. Um, so it's, a, it's basically, I like to refer to it as a tree aspirin. It's got uh, imidacloprid incorporated into this and also some nutrients, macro and micronutrients incorporated in. And you can bury these in the soil around the base of a tree and allow, the rain, allow precipitation and rainwater will slowly dissolve those. Um, so the chemical and nutrients get taken up through the roots of the tree. So these have been really useful for some treatments in areas where you don't wanna have to backpack a lot of water in to do your treatments. Uh, so most people ask me, what do I do to save my hemlock? I tell them if you have an individual or, or a small number of, of high value trees that you wanna save, chemical controls are really your best option right now. Uh, but they are expensive, uh, but very, uh, very useful for saving those high, those um, individual high value trees you may be interested in protecting. The other strategy is biological control. Um, and really, this has been looked at from two different uh, standpoints. So this is looking at what are our opportunities for utilizing other insects in the forests that may feed on the adelgid. And so there was initially work looking at native and naturalized predators and uh, parasitoids, insects that are already in the system in the east. Um, could we uh, take advantage of some of these? There are a lot of different types of predatory and parasitoid insects that feed on adelgids, um, feed on aphids, which are related insects. So could we utilize these? And so there was a lot of research done here, uh, but very quickly became obvious these are all very much generalist insects. Um, they don't really focus in on any one type of prey, so they didn't really offer 
any opportunities for effective long-term control. So probably uh, where most of the money has been spent to this point on management of the adelgid is in classical biological control or the importation of predators, right? Taking advantage of the fact that we know in Asia and in the Pacific Northwest, the adelgid is native and there are predators in those ecosystems that are specialists on the adelgid. Um, so there's uh, ongoing efforts to go exploring um, in those forests, identifying uh, potential predators and bringing them and releasing them um, in our forests in the east for control of the adelgid. This does show some level of promise, um, at least a couple of these. These beetles here, this you may have heard of these, are called Larry beetles or Laracobius, uh, one from the Pacific Northwest and one from Japan um, that are being widely released um, all the way from Maine south to Georgia. And they are establishing. Um, and are establishing reproducing populations. But it remains yet to be known if they'll actually offer any level of effective control um, of the adelgid on their own. They probably never will on their own, um, but uh, as part of a larger IPM program. So a lot of work going on here that is beginning to show some promise. I was a huge skeptic of biological control at first, um, but starting to see some rays of hope with it. The other area um, where I already mentioned we were kind of behind the game um, when it comes uh, to dealing with hemlock woolly adelgid is breeding for resistance. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where has some of the focus been at this point? Um, and hopefully you'll be able to glean from this, uh, you know, where, what lessons do we have to learn from you guys that are working on, on the chestnut issue? So at this point, uh, really made three main areas we've been, that have been focused on. There's the search for lingering hemlocks. Um, you also see this referred to as the bulletproof hemlocks, um, like the, the trees in Delaware Water Gap, which have been identified as potentially resistant, uh, which are the subject of this paper I'm showing here. It was published by colleagues at the University of Rhode Island. Um, so Rhode Island has a program where they're out looking for these lingering hemlocks to try to understand are they uh, potentially uh, a potential source of resistance. Um, there's also a program at North Carolina State University called the Forest Restoration Alliance. Um, I'm same university, but I'm not associated with this program, but this is run by my mentor and PhD advisor, Dr. Fred Hain, um, that's doing the same thing, right? So um, still a lot of work, uh, going on here looking for lingering trees. Uh, but at this point, just a handful of genotypes, four genotypes which are being tested, but still a lot more work that can be done. Because as I can tell you, there are a lot of trees, uh, hemlocks out there that are lingering, that are holding on. So that could be uh, a potential uh, benefit to this program. The other are the interspecific hybrids um, and the potential for moving forward with back cross breeding. Um, there has been some work done at the National Arboretum they did a lot of work on making F1 hybrids, uh, particularly between Carolina hemlock and Chinese hemlock. And they are now market, marketing what they call the traveler hemlock, hemlock. So it's a Chinese by Carolina cross that does show good resistance to the adelgid. Um, and again, uh, just, just to remind you, as I said, you know, this makes sense that this was successful because Carolina hemlock is actually more closely related to the Asian species um, than, it is, than it is to any um, of the other hemlocks. Um, and the Eastern hemlock, again, is a sister group to all the other hemlocks. And to this point, there's been a lot of effort to hybridize Eastern hemlock with some of these other species, and none of these crosses have been successful. Um, and there's still research going on to try to understand exactly what the issue is. Um, but it does, I, I think the, the outcome is that there is some post-pollination issue, um, incompat incompatibility issue that causes embryos to abort. Um, so maybe some more work that can be done to untangle this, but unfortunately, to th at this point, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to cross Eastern uh, with any of the other hemlock species. Um, and of course, there is a little bit of work going on in genomics and biotechnology as well. Um, I have some colleagues at NC State that are, that work, who worked with Scott Merkel, at the University of Georgia uh, to develop somatic embryogenesis protocols for Eastern and Carolina hemlock. At, initially, as a, as a, a second 
uh, way other than seed storage of preserving uh, hemlock germplasm long term. They're now beginning to move into utilizing uh, these SE cultures as a source for using CRISPR to do genome editing um, and to understand if they'll be able to do that in hemlock. Um, this is paired with a transcriptome analysis ongoing um, where they are trying to understand on a genetic level, what are the responses of the adelgid to the infestation? So what are the potential gene targets uh, that could be utilized uh, for gene editing to potentially arrive at resistance uh, to the species, um, to the adelgid? Um, and then finally, there's a couple of different programs working on a genome assembly um, through the Green Trees Genome Project. Um, for both Eastern and Carolina hemlock, uh, particularly colleagues at the University of Connecticut. Um, and I'm actively collaborating um, on this effort um, as well on the Eastern hemlock end of things. So that's kind of uh, where we stand as far as chemical, biological control and the host resistance. Um, and what I wanna do with the rest of my time then is to spend some time talking about uh, two of the main areas of research I have been focused in. Um, that I think will be of interest to this group uh, for the standpoint of restoration. And that's the work in gene conservation and silvicultural restoration of hemlocks. So really quickly, I don't think I need to review this uh, for this group, uh, but just give a brief reminder to everyone, what are we talking about when we're talking about genetic resource conservation of forest tree species? Sierra was already talking about this earlier, but efforts to conserve the genetic and adaptive variation of tree species that are facing some sort of threat, whether that's an insect, a disease, climate change, or whatever, whatever, right? We have a number of different threats out there that are causing a lot of issues for tree species. So we need to uh, make some efforts to conserve those. We can do this two ways. We can do this in situ. We can conserve the trees in their natural environments. Or what we're really talking about here today is ex situ, where we're going in and we're going to rescue germplasm from natural population and move those either into seed banks or to seed orchards or some other protected planting, right? And I think um, it's really interesting to me now, it took us a while to get here, but efforts to secure genetic resources for threatened tree species are now at the forefront of an initial response to an invasive pest or disease issue or some other issue, whereas that was not always the case, right? I think American chestnut is a good example uh, when chestnut blight was moving through, there was a lot of emphasis on salvage of lumber, but not so much maybe on, well, maybe we should conserve uh, some seed resources for chestnut. That was a lesson that was learned when we started dealing with hemlock, woolly adelgid, uh, but unfortunately that it's still awaited. We were about 15 years into the epidemic of hemlock woolly adelgid before our gene conservation programs got started. Um, so we, we still lost a lot of potential genetic resources before we got started on that. But now we look at something like emerald ash borer and what it's doing to all of our ash species. And gene conservation was something the people working in ash started right out of the gate. Um, they, 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 they learned from the past and have begun, began implementing those, those strategies very quickly. Uh, so this is what I was hired to do at CAMCOR back in 2005 to come in and initiate a gene conservation program for Eastern and Carolina hemlock across their ranges in the Eastern United States. So I've spent a lot of time the last 15 years out in the woods, hiking around, uh, trying, you know, finding seed bearing trees. We've been, this is my uh, coworker, Andy Whittier, who's our tree climber. So we've been out collecting that seed getting that material packaged up. Um, we have, we've maintained it in seed banks here on campus in Raleigh. Uh, we also send it to the Gen uh, National Center for Genetic Resource Preservation in uh, Fort Colorado. So some of the material backed up there, uh, but we're also getting it out into seed orchards, right? Because even under the best storage conditions, seed's gonna have a, a limited shelf life. So we're trying to get seed orchards out there um, in the ground um, so we can continue producing uh, fresh viable seed, hopefully for future breeding and restoration efforts. And this is a picture of a Carolina hemlock orchard that we have in Western North Carolina. And of course, it's not just, uh, Sarah will tell you, it's not just about going out and uh, collecting some seed. Uh, we do want to target, we have limited resources, so we need to target our collections in a way that we maximize diversity. Um, 
and adaptability in the popul in, in the seed collections. So there's a lot that we do in the background in research as far as how we go about uh, capturing that variation. Um, you know, we look at variation with climate, habitat type, elevation, soil types. We do seed zone modeling. But really at the core of all this is the work we do on population genetics. I um, mean, using uh, molecular markers to understand patterns of diversity for the species across their geographic ranges and what that tells us about how to uh, focus seed collections. And so this is kind of an interesting diagram here from some of our work on Eastern Hemlock. Um, these circles are described one level of genetic diversity or one measure of genetic diversity as alleles per locus. So the larger the circle, the more alleles per locus, so the more diverse the population. Um, and this is an interesting uh, diagram because it, it told us something we didn't really understand when we first started working with the species. We expected a cluster of high genetic diversity in the southern Appalachians. We did not necessarily expect uh, the same up in the northeast, um, but we are seeing in New York, um, southern New England, uh, that we have another interesting little pocket of high hemlock genetic diversity. And so that tells us we can focus our sampling intensity in the south and in, and in the, the north in these general areas, and we'll capture most of the diversity in the species. That's not to say we ignore the rest of the, the species range. Uh, we still go to these areas, but we probably focus most of our collections. Um, and if you want to read a little bit of, uh, more about uh, the outcomes of, of this project, it's still ongoing. Uh, but a few years ago, we did publish this paper in Tree Planner's Notes that sort of gives a general overview of how this gene conservation program came together. And at the point we published, what had we achieved as far as seed collections go? And for Carolina hemlock, we have a very nice range-wide collection. Um, Eastern hemlock, we're still trying to fill in some holes here. Uh, but particularly in this high diversity area up in uh, uh, Northeast Pennsylvania, New York, um, that area, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and quite frankly, I'm down here in Raleigh. Um, it's not always easy, particularly during the pandemic, uh, to get up to this region. So we're always looking for people willing to go out, collect some seed and send it our way uh, for the conservation program. So the final uh, aspect of uh, what we're doing at NC State that I want to talk about is work we're doing in silviculture um, as an opportunity for utilizing this as part of the management strategy. And this is an area of research we got into because I work with a lot of forest managers on the ground in the forests that they manage, um, consulting on chemical control or biological control, doing seed collections. Um, and they're always asking, what can we do from a civil cultural standpoint to help benefit uh, this overall program? Um, and the more my colleagues and I heard that, the more we realized we should probably spend some time thinking about that. Right. So what is silviculture? There's a lot of uh, different uh, definitions, but silviculture is essentially uh, forest architecture. Manipulate that architecture to benefit the stand um, in different ways, whether that's from a timber production uh, standpoint, or can we utilize it to make stands more resilient against stress, uh, particularly such as a forest insect, right? And there's a number of different examples of the way we do this, um, depending on forest, the particular forest pests we're talking about. Um, and the area we're really uh, focused on for hemlock is what can we do from a civil cultural standpoint to make the environment, forest environment less favorable for the adult? Um, and so what we're the, really the main question is, can we use some, a silvicultural strategy that will cause the insect to not want, like these, can, these forests as much and help us retain hemlocks longer on the landscape? And the reason we think this is possible are, is this, uh, you know, illustrated in these pictures here. And these are what I like to call observations that made me scratch my head a little bit. Um, if you come down particularly to the south, and walk around hemlock forest, you'll see a lot of uh, trees that look like this tree here on the left. It's what we call a hemlock lollipop. Um, it's the top of the canopy that sticks up into the sunlight is still alive, has green foliage on it. Everything else that's down in the shaded understory part of the canopy has died, right? Um, and this part of the tree will hang on. It'll be the last part of the tree that dies. And a lot of these lingering trees that we have 
look like this, right? And so that tells us there's something interesting about an, inter an interaction between the tree, the insect and sunlight that we might be able to take advantage of. You can see the same sort of relationships in forest interior. So here's an understory hemlock that's very got a very shaded forest canopy. So uh, the, granted, this picture was taken in the winter, but un, uh, under full leaf out, this tree would be very shaded, not a lot of sunlight, and it doesn't look uh, like a very healthy hemlock. It's really, it's to a state of decline where it's probably not going to bounce back. Versus another tree, understory tree here, and this is one that's on a forest edge or on a roadside, right? And roadsides and forest edges, trees tend to have a lot of more sunlight exposure, exposure, particularly if it's a southern exposure. Um, this tree is getting a lot of sunlight uh, from the road exposure, and it actually looks pretty good, right? So all evidence to suggest that some sort of forest thinning or something like that might be a benefit to retaining hemlock. But it's certainly not a silver bullet by any form or fashion. I've already shown this picture once. These trees clearly were receiving a lot of sunlight before they, uh, they died. Um, so it, we're not suggesting sunlight's a silver bullet. We're just suggesting it's a tool we might be able to utilize to retain hemlocks in the forest a little bit longer, which may allow us time to get other management strategies in place in these stands uh, to help save those trees. So we've actually been doing work on this for about the last uh, seven or eight years now, um, not just at NC State and the Forest Service in the South. We also have colleagues um, in other parts of the East that have been working on this. And we all started with what we call garden studies. And these are all studies that focused on trees, little hemlock seedlings and pots. Um, and we just ex infested them with the adelgid and then we exposed them uh, to different levels of sunlight using shade cloth. Um, and what we saw overall in these studies is that pretty consistently adelgid density decreased as we increased the amount of sunlight exposure on the seedlings. And when we saw a lot of other things as well, just um, the improvement in health of the carbon balance um, and other things like, like that in the tree that were a benefit to the tree. So healthier trees, uh, lower adelgid densities, right? And this is uh, one of what our studies um, in Western North Carolina look like. So, you know, you can see the, the trees in the pots and the different shade treatments. I mean, we actually did two different studies here um, that were going on simultaneously. So that's kind of how these studies went. Um, and they really pointed out, you know, told us that, you know, we think so sunlight, the adelgid doesn't like it for whatever reason. So we were really encouraged by this. So then we collaborated with some, some of our colleagues at Kuita Hydrological Lab in Western North Carolina. And we actually went out into the forest and said, okay, let's take little groups of understory hemlocks and let's release them. Let's cut a big gap and increase sunlight on those trees versus trees in reference conditions. Um, and what we saw in these studies is that, yes, um, if you increase the amount of sunlight on the trees, this is the basal area growth, they grow a lot more. They're, they are shade tolerant, but do like the sunlight for growth. We saw a lot of the same improvements in carbon balance and overall health of the trees. But when we took this from a controlled shade, you know, study in potted seedlings out to the forest, even though we saw improved health of the trees we released, there was actually no differences in adelgid density among these trees, right? So that caused us to scratch our head a little bit, uh, not exactly what we hoped to see, but still indicates some potential benefit um, of this uh, work moving forward. Um, so we are doing now, taking this idea and expanding it across a larger part of the range of Eastern Hemlock, where we're going out and releasing individual trees um, in the forest to increase sunlight exposure um, and and to evaluate these same relationships across a larger uh, part of the range. Um, I'm still a little bit amazed. We actually pulled this study off, but you can see the distribution of the sites we're, that we have for this study right now. Um, you can see we're almost up in your neck of the woods. So we're working in Garrett and Allegheny counties um, in Western Maryland, um, which are probably my favorite sites uh, to visit for this study is beautiful forest um, up, up in this part of the world. Uh, Southwest Virginia, and then down in North Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee as well is where we have replications. The study 
Um, so we zoom in here. This is Green River Game Lands um, in the uh, side of Hendersonville, uh, North Carolina. We have three replications of the study there. Um, and each replication is essentially five target trees, uh, which we've treated in different ways to create gaps. We're creating two sizes of gaps, large gaps or small gaps, and gap creation methods is by either felling trees or girdling trees. And then, of course, we have a control tree where um, uh, we have done uh, nothing at all, leaving it out there in reference conditions. Uh, I won't go over this uh, too much because I know I'm already taking up uh, too much time. Um, but uh, so we're out there releasing these trees using these different methods. And you can see what some of these look like uh, from some drone shots we took. So you can see a gap we, we created by felling. You can see our subject hemlock here at the middle. We also had some residual hemlocks um, that we left as well. Everything we cut around it was a hardwood of some type. And this, of course, would be a girdled gap where we just girdled the trees to kill them. Um, and this is what some of these uh, trees look like before and after. So this is on the Jefferson National Forest in Virginia. This is one of these trees. We created a large gap by felling. Uh, so you can see it before and after. So you can really see we have really are putting a lot of sunlight on the tree. And obviously, from a forest management standpoint, this is not, this is not really translatable to a stand level release. But here, we're just trying to do um, use an experimental approach to understand um, if this will work and if uh, then we'll have to translate this to some other sort of stand level um, application. Um, so a lot of different uh, data that we're out there collecting. Here's me working in the snow and in Western Maryland. Obviously, I need to buy some gloves being from the south. I, I don't appreciate the climate that you guys uh, have further north like I should. Um, but we've been collecting data and we've been collecting data for about three years now. I would real quickly just go over two of the data graphs here for you, um, just to kind of show you what we're seeing. Um, so this, these graphs are split um, into three sections. We have trees in the north. So these are our Maryland trees, the trees sort of in the central part of the range. These are our Virginia trees. Um, and then this bottom graph, this is everything in Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And what should be obvious uh, from the start is that in Maryland and Virginia, we started with good adelgid infestation on these trees, and then it crashed all across the board. We had big drop off in adelgid populations on these trees. Um, and this was due to polar vortex events, right? Like this extreme cold weather um, that the adelgid really doesn't like. Um, so our experimental trees in, to the, in the north and the, in the central part of the range aren't really, we're not really seeing much uh, from this data yet, but in the south, we are. Um, and I wanna draw your attention to the green line, red lines. Uh, the red lines are the control trees. So the trees that are just out there under normal conditions. The solid green line is the tree, that large fell treatment where we really opened up a large we can see from the start, we started with relatively low adelgid population densities in these trees, but we can see on the control trees, so under shaded conditions, which we think the adelgid prefers, their populations declined very rapidly, while on our large fell trees with lots of sunlight, they didn't. They remained pretty consistently low for a couple of years. But over time, that relationship has shifted. Uh, we're now seeing our adelgid populations on those sunlit trees, are, have grown uh, to very large levels, the highest densities that we have, whereas our the delta densities on our control trees have crashed. That crash is likely due to the fact that our populations got very big very quickly, the tree declined in health, and that as a result, the, the delta population crashed. Whereas these trees are putting on a lot of new growth, they're very healthy trees and they're continuing to grow, right? So that's a little disappointing to see uh, that the adelgid populations on these trees are really starting to catch up. Uh, but when we look at the flip side and we look at foliar transparency is one measure of tree health that we can use. And the lower the foliar transparency, the healthier the tree, right? So transparency is just how much sunlight can you see through the crown of the tree? So a thicker crown is gonna have less sunlight coming through. So despite the fact that 
these uh, large fell trees are supporting very high adelgid densities, from a health standpoint, they're actually still extremely healthy trees. And what we think we've created here is a condition where the trees are just able to outgrow the impact of the adelgid and to keep putting out new growth, keep putting in stored reserves uh, so they can persist in the environment, right? So at the end of the day, we think perhaps we're buying these trees some time. And you can see that in these pictures here. This is that same large fell tree I showed you in Virginia. I mean, you can see it before we cut it, after we cut it, um, you know, in 2018, then again um, in 2020. And you can see the crown of this tree is filling in um, and the tree is looking, having that much deeper green color that we expect of an Eastern hemlock, right? But I can also tell you this tree is absolutely covered in adelgids as well. So plenty of adelgid on this tree, but it's persisting and continuing to improve in health. So just a few summary comments here uh, to remind you again, we're not looking at sunlight as a silver bullet to solve the adelgid problem. We want this to be part of the overall IP strategy for the adelgid. Um, we think we're giving we're getting short-term decreases in adelgid densities when we release trees um, that lead to improved hemlock crown health and carbon balance. And we think this may be a window of opportunity to get other management strategies established on the ground, either the biocontrols or get out there and get some as part of the management strategy as well. So we're trying to come, you know, make an overall larger effort in IPM here. Um, and of course, the benefit of these treatments is going to vary by region, we think is what we're starting to see. You know, in the South, we have consistently high adelgid population pressure, pressure because our winters aren't that cold. Um, so we think silviculture is gonna be very useful in the South, but towards the North where winter mortality of the adelgid is more of an issue, uh, winters may be helping achieve this, cold winters may be helping achieve these same outcomes for hemlock. And just real briefly before I, I close it up, um, I just wanna mention that we are all, in addition to doing this silvicultural release work, we are actually doing some research as well on how we go about reintroducing hemlocks, you know, trying to get some advanced data in place for hopefully someday when we do have resistant hemlocks that we can begin establishing in the forest. Um, and these are some studies uh, that we're involved in in Western North Carolina. Um, you can see here we have a large canopy gap where we planted hemlocks and replicated blocks. Some of them are protected with deer fence. You can make out the deer fence there. Uh, we have different uh, treatments that we've applied within these blocks. And we're doing this in canopy gaps and we're also doing it in under intact canopy. You can kind of barely make out one of the planting blocks right there under the canopy. So I will stop there. I'm sorry, that was a lot of material in a relatively short amount of time. Hopefully I can um, answer a few questions, um, but uh, Sarah knows how to get in touch with me. If you have others, um, we'll be happy to um, answer any questions uh, via email as well. Excellent. I, um, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to ask the, the, the questions from other people first. Um, Ed Buchak just asked, um, is there a supporting organization like TACF for hemlock restoration and how is your research funded? So great question. Um, we do not have a program uh, like the Chestnut Foundation. Um, Fred Hain, my PhD advisor who started that Forest Restoration Alliance, uh, the American Chestnut Foundation is his model. That's where he would like that to go someday, um, but still very much in the early stages. Um, the thing I, you know, we always talk about is American Chestnut found there's already, you know, a lot of research being done, right? We actually knew a fair amount about chestnut and maybe how to breed for resistance by the time the Chestnut Foundation was founded. And we need to kind of get to that point with Hemlock where people are going to be interested um, in giving um, in supporting a program like that. Um, so I think there's still a lot to learn from your group. My research is primarily funded uh, through grants from the United States Forest Service. Um, I also get through some through uh, the NCDA uh, and the NC Forest Service as well. So that's my primary funding. Um, so Ethan Habriel makes a comment. He says he has a number of uninfected hemlocks uh, on his place in Eastern Pennsylvania. 
Um, let's see, I wanna go up and ask Clark's question. Um, Clark Beebe, formerly of Northern New Jersey and now of Colorado. Um, I heard that in Northern New Jersey, they had found some adelgid resistant trees. I heard the mechanism was similar to sugar maples where some super trees have 8% sugar in the sap as opposed to the normal 2%. Similarly, the resistant hemlocks had higher concentrations of certain chemicals that were not palatable to the adelgid. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so I'm not super familiar with that, but those are the trees that were the, the subject of that, uh, the paper that was published on evaluating lingering hemlocks in the forest. Um, and uh, they've done a lot of work to understand, uh, you know, from a chemical standpoint, you know, are they less palatable? Are they not? Um, so yeah, that, that is true. I'm not fully up to speed uh, on exactly what's underlying that though, but those are the, the bulletproof trees, which are in, I've been to that stand. It's in uh, right on the edge of Delaware Water Gap, I believe, so. Cool. Um, Stephen Hoy asks, are there certain characteristics in addition to tolerance being selected for with the hybrids? So they are definitely selecting for, uh, traits of interest to the ornamental industry. So, you know, different weep, you know, they, I think they want to incorporate weeping varieties. Um, they're obviously selecting for adaptability to ornamental environments, right? So that's a concern. Um, a lot of people are wanting to run out and start planting those trees all in, in the forest. And I'm like, wait, you know, hold, hold on, you know, they're probably not going to be well adapted to those conditions. So, but it's a starting point, right? So, um, the big disappointment there is that it's Carolina. I mean, I I love Carolina hemlock. Uh, it's my favorite tree species. Uh, but you know, the real the issues with the eastern hemlock are so much larger, um, and the need is larger. And the fact that we can't hybridize that with any of the other species is really disappointing. So, yeah, um, I have a couple questions, if I may. Um, really fascinated by the genetic architecture um, uh, landscape um, wise of, of uh, Eastern hemlock. So in, in American chestnut, we don't see that as you expected or hypothesized with hemlock, we see that huge boon of diversity in the Southern Appalachians. And then it peters out as you go North, you know, more and more and more um, and, and really kind of tanks in Northern in New England. So what is it with that population in Southern New England? What, how, how did that happen? What are you seeing that, that gives it that, you know, shot of diversity? So, you know, it's a great question, Sarah, and it's all hypothesis at this point, um, but it has been hypothesized that there was, um, there were remnant stands off of the New England coasts on the continental shelf of a lot of our tree species uh, during glaciation. And that perhaps you know uh, that part was it repopulated um, the north, and we had a different uh, pop populations that uh, populated the south. If you go to that paper, and Sarah, I can send it to you. But if you look at the gene pool data too, it shows there that is a distinct gene pool um, in the north versus the two primary gene pools we have in the south, and they are converging. And interestingly, that northern gene pool has moved south. Um, from there, so, um, but yeah, that, that, but we don't really know, you know, it, it's, it's all hypothesis, so. That's still fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we got a question from Barbara Murphy who asks, is there any correlation between acid rain and hemlock woolly adelgid? Ah, good question. Um, you know, so there's a related insect, the balsam woolly adelgid, uh, that wiped out our native populations of Fraser fir in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. That co did coincide with that period of time when, you know, we had a lot of smog and acid rain issues blowing down out of the Ohio Valley that would settle into the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, and it was definitely an underlying stress uh, for Fraser fir, um, but those trees would have succumbed anyway. It, they just, they may have lasted longer. Um, it's the same issue we had with drought in the Southern Appalachian Mountains when the adelgid first arrived, we had like a severe three-year drought. Um, and that's why we lost so many trees so quickly. Uh, but, you know, we don't have the same issues with acid rain and atmospheric deposition anymore in the South. And that has a lot to do with the clean, cleaner coal technology and, and other things like that in the Ohio Valley. So, um, so yeah, we have not seen that same interaction. Uh, another question Clark asks, isn't there a second hemlock problem with hemlock scale? So 
that's a great question. Um, so elongate hemlock scale, another invasive, um, which is out there. It's for the most part has not been that damaging to hemlock. Although my understanding from colleagues in Connecticut is that now that cold winter temperatures have kind of knocked out hemlock woolly adulgid, it is starting to impact eastern hemlock more, probably because stress that the adulgid caused on those trees. In the south, the biggest, or in North Carolina, the biggest issue we have with elongate hemlock scale, you know, we have 40,000 acres of Fraser fir planted for Christmas tree production. I mean, we're the second largest Christmas tree producing state in the country. Um, and elongate hemlock scale, you know, it's, it's called elongate hemlock scale, but it likes conifers in general. And it's really caused issues in Fraser fir Christmas trees. It doesn't damage the trees, but it's a huge regulatory issue. We, we ship trees to every state in the country and some foreign countries. And if you're a state that doesn't have elongate hemlock scale yet, you don't want North Carolina Fraser firs coming in with it. That's a whole other area of research I, I'm involved in too. So, it's, but no, good question. So yeah, that one is out there. How, you know, I'm a one species woman. How many species do you work on? Uh, as far as tree species and insects go, too many. I'll say that, you know, okay. but that's, that's the life of, uh, you know, being a uh, tenure track faculty at the university chasing, chasing the grant dollars. So, you know, we're working on scale, we're working on adelgids. I work on both adelgids. I'm working on a, uh, emerald ash borer as well, which is just not a fun one to work on because uh, there's just no stopping that insect, unfortunately. I got one more question. Um, well, two more, actually. Jim, do we want to take these or do we want to try and do yeah. our breakouts? Take one more and then we'll... Uh, <laughs> All right, I got to choose. Um, I'll go with Don. He said, uh, is imidacloprid effect for, oh, effective for scale? Ah, good question. Um, depends on who you ask. Um, Rich Coles at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station has had a lot of success controlling scale with imidacloprid. Um, we're, you know, on hemlock and on other Christmas tree species. Um, on Fraser fir, we and we haven't seen a lot has had a lot of success with it. Um, but we think that just may be a different area it's feeding on Fraser fir versus a hemlock. So is it going to encounter it when it feeds on the plant? So. Jim, can I ask this other one? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, because yeah, this is a really good question from Hoy. Okay, and I think it, it has application to chestnut too. So, yes. you know, a lot of people ask us the same question. Can we just replace American chestnut with Chinese chestnut or European chestnut or, you know, whatever it has? And we have our answers to that. Hoy asks, uh, would any of the Western native species just fill the same ecological role? Why can't you just bring that over? Can you, have you thought about that? Have you tried it? So a lot of people have talked about that, Stephen. It's a, it's a good question. Um, so if you've ever seen mountain hemlock, um, it really doesn't have the canopy architecture or attain the right stature. Uh, so it's not gonna fill that ecological role uh, that Eastern hemlock will. Maybe Carolina hemlock, it would. They're, they're kind of similar in that architecture and kind of small stature trees. Western hemlock is definitely a large uh, stature, weeping branch type tree like Eastern hemlock is, but it's not going to be well adapted. It's a cloud forest adapted species, right? And we're just not going to have that same condition. So we've tried to grow them in Western North Carolina and they just, they don't take, they, they'll, they'll get started, but then they, they usually die out. So yeah. um, I just don't think, um, yeah, I, I just don't think there's a good replacement for Eastern hemlock. Yeah. Okay, so I, I get to ask a question. Uh, do we know when the Eastern hemlock, do we have any idea when it arrived in North America? Eastern hemlock or the, the insect? Eastern, the hemlock itself. I'm going back, you know, thousands. Uh, of yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question. So I'm having to think back to a paper I read during my uh, dis dissertation days uh, when, and I can't remember it. Um, there is work that was done looking at um, sort of pollen, you know, soil uh, pollen data on hemlocks all across the northern hemisphere, and they were ubiquitous across the northern hemisphere at one point. Um, and uh, but yeah, I, okay, 
I can't, I can't remember exactly. So right. it's an obscure question. I just ask him because um, I've been working on it relative to chestnut. You know, Robert, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I'm struck by a couple of parallels. One is you're taking multiple approaches to try to try to resolve, try to solve an issue. Uh, secondly, is how how uh, parallel the range uh, of of a hemlock is to chestnut. I think hemlock likes may, may like more water than chestnut, but um, but they certainly were neighbors uh, in a lot of their range. Um, the lessons learned, like uh, the work that was done to cut every chestnut tree <laughs> on God's earth in the in the in the uh, you know in the period of time after 1904, just um, did not leave the opportunity very much for lingering. Uh, uh, and I know lingering, there are some lingering ash trees, I, I believe. Yep. Uh, and there's hope and there's, uh, and as you pointed out, there's potentially ling lingering hemlock. I love the labeling. I like the traveling hemlock concept. Uh, I also like the gene, just the simplicity of the gene, of gene conservation. I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist. You know, I, I'm I'm a I've come from the business world, but I just I just like the the um, I like the the precision of that, or maybe the imprecision of that, as the scientists would say. So, um, you know, and I and I really think it's it's great if we keep looking for the intersection of you know what we're doing and what others are, are doing, and, and learn from that. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed this, even though, even even on a Saturday morning. Yes. Um, this is this okay. fun to get together um, to be able to talk about these things and, and, and trade ideas. Um, like I said, I, th I think we have a lot to learn uh, from your your program uh, moving forward. So, thank you again uh, for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed this. So, thank you.